The curative qualities and other little known facts of the jalapeño and its pepper cousins are many. Menudo Mexican tripe soup, known as the National Mexican Breakfast of Champions, is known to cure hangovers. The truth? It is the chile in the menudo that activates the juices in your system and fights against alcohol dehydration. According to Dr. T.F. Burks of the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center, hot peppers contain capsaicin, a chemical that is responsible for the piquancy and can effectively relieve certain types of pain. Like acupuncture, capsaicin blocks the nerve pathways that carry pain signals to the brain in chronic conditions such as pinched nerves and tumors. A chile a day keeps the doctor away. U.S. government studies show that people living in the Southwest have the lowest death rate from heart disease and cancer in the United States. One doctor, Laura M. Shields, reported that chile may help rid the body of enough fats to lower cholesterol. When the diet of the Otomi Indians of Central Mexico was, was studied by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their diet was found to be much more nutritious than the diet of a group of U.S. town dwellers. Since pre-Columbian times, the chile was used to folk, in folk medicine as a remedy for inflamed kidneys, chills, heart pains, and tumors. One ounce of chile contains as much as 20,000 units of vitamin A, which is twice the minimum daily requirement. Fresh chiles have even higher levels. 100 grams of Texas green chile contains 235 milligrams of vitamin C while a California orange has about 49 milligrams. Calcium content in chiles is also high. According to Albuquerque Living's Lifestyle Poll in March 1987, Anglos prefer green chile and Latinos love red chile. Curanderas, folk medicine healers, believe that hot chili peppers and salt on top of a cross made of nails can ward off witches. In 1937, Dr. Albert Zent. Georgi was awarded to the Nobel Prize in Science for his studies of vitamin C in paprika peppers, a cousin of the jalapeño. Cold and sensitive feet or those with poor blood circulation have been revived by sprinkling socks or nylons with hot red chili pepper uh, powder. In 1982, astronaut Bill Lenore had an upset stomach that was linked to the jalapeño peppers he had carried into orbit. Eating and digesting chile is a process that takes some getting used to, especially in outer space. Start off slow and build up. Find the chile that you like, but that doesn't act like acupuncture, blocking your enjoyment of the food. But once you're enchilado, try to remain calm and not panic. People have gotten hurt when they run, trip, bump their heads, or poison themselves by drinking the first liquid they see. Your best bet is dairy products, milk, sour cream, ice cream. Dr. Paul Rosen of the University of Pennsylvania Psychology Department conducted a study of cultural food preferences, particularly of the chili pepper. According to Dr. Rosen, chile aids digestion by stimulating gastric secretion and salivation and helps to cool off the body by causing the face to sweat. Furthermore, Dr. Rosen suspects that hot peppers trigger the release of endorphins, which are a natural opiates of the brain, into the chili eater system. So it may be that my addiction to jalapenos is caused not by cultural affiliation or heredity, but by endorphins. Five. The Great Taco War. In Redwood City, California, the Mexican flag was hoisted over the Taco Bell fast food restaurant and the local Mexican-American business community was angered and the flag was taken down. The Taco Bell is determined to make inroads into the Mexican community through its culture and economics. Tacos have become the hamburger's stiffest competitor as this country's favorite fast food. As of 1990, Taco Bell had already jumped ahead of McDonald's, but forget hamburgers for a couple of minutes. Today, Taco Bell has not only infiltrated the barrios, but has even opened its first restaurant in, of all places, Mexico City. 
A Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant in Beijing or McDonald's in Moscow does not seem as strange as a Taco Bell in the capital city of Mexico. I was already aghast that they're having built a Taco Bell in San Francisco's Mission District, where salsa music, bright murals, and traffic lights compete for attention, and where there are where there is at least one taqueria every two blocks. And the Mission District taquerias are San Francisco's novel eating place. Yuppies and business executives from uptown dine elbow to elbow with cholos and other Latinos on exquisitely exquisitely prepared designer tacos and burritos made from the charcoal, diced beef, chicken, pork, corned beef, tongue, brains, or veggies for vegetarian. The taquerias are so popular that most customers are variable connoisseurs of which is the talk of the town. So it was brazen of Taco Bell to come into the Mission District and sell their mild imitations of the real thing. Even still, they sold tacos to Chicanos and other Latinos in the barrio like they were going out of estilo. ¿Qué pasó? Taco Bell was competing with what some call the best taquerias north of the border. The news was so disturbing that the godfather of the Mission District, René Yanis, took me to see it. You gotta write about this, he said. This fast food restaurant came complete with California Mission-style architecture and a yellow plastic bell. It was surrounded by a beauty salon, a Chinese restaurant, a hardware store, and a mattress store. In the morning, the Taco Bell Corner serves as an unemployment line for Latinos in search of day's work. Taco Bell does brisk business. What seems seemed like a crowd from the outside was a show, I mean, was a slow, meandering line, Disneyland style. This was better than walking into a burger place and wondering which line would move faster, only to get behind the guy ordering 20 Big Macs, 10 regular fries, 10 large fries, 5 Diet Cokes, 5 regular Cokes, 10 malts, and 2 coffees for a hungry work crew. The Taco Bell menu can be a mystery if one is not familiar with the renamed food items. They can e even puzzle a bicultural person. What's an enchilito? A combination burrito and enchilada, the manager answered, half bored and following his response with a half accusing glance at my ignorance. I envisioned a half burrito, half enchilada transplant and felt the heartburn coming on. They also featured Mexican pizza, which was a flat flour tortilla smothered with refried beans and topped with ground beef, cheese, and shredded lettuce. But what were cinnamon crispas? They were similar to buñuelos. Fried flour tortillas generally sprinkled with sugar and cinnamon. Other items in the menu included the nachos bel grande, taco bel grande, and of course the kids fiesta meal, which seemed incomplete without a piñata. They also listed steak fajitas and chicken fajitas, complete with the helpful phonetic spelling, fajitas. I ordered two tacos prepared with a prefabricated hard tortilla shell at room temperature. Rene ordered the Mexican pizza. The meat was lukewarm and the cheese and shredded lettuce was, was cold. Halfway through the taco, the shell crumbled between my fingers and landed on my tray. Rene laughed, and then I realized the reason for the plastic fork. When I finally got to taste my taco, it was different and tasty in a funny sort of way. There is something surreal about having to tear a little plastic package with one's teeth in order to get to a salsa that is more mild and sweet than hot. Give me a dark green fresh jalapeno to sink my teeth into any day. Orders are served in under five minutes and placed on a plastic tray with the paper placement headlined the border run. It depicts an open highway in the desert leading to a Taco Bell and surrounded by highway signs that tell you to crack it, bust it, jump it, snap it, or cross it. This, of course, is a subtle reference to crossing the border illegally or jumping a once proposed. 15 mile did south of San Diego. The hidden message is that eating at Taco Bell can be not only a treat, but a real live Indiana Jones adventure. And who is the clientele in this Taco Bell in the barrio? Los pobres, poor people, seniors can on fixed retirement incomes and immigrants who have jumped cross or beat it to the side 
to this side. At 59 cents a taco, where else can a poor family eat for less than $10 with free drinks, uh, free drink refills? Where else can Latino teenagers hang out to socialize? Not at the Barrios Taquerias, where tacos start at one fifty each. A typical day will find the outdoor seating of Taco Bell filled with Latinos of various ages. On one occasion, a group of Batos Locos, crazy dudes, yelled at each other across the tables using foul Espanol. This didn't faze the older and younger women who kept right on conversing and eating. On the second visit, there was a whole daycare nursery of some 18 small fries. I mean, four and five-year-old children. Where else could they have afforded lunch? In other parts of the city, you can see the tacos price war between Taco Bell and Jack in the Box. 89 cents a taco, 49 cents a taco, 39 cents a taco, three for a dollar. There's no end to the sales. Not to be outdone, the Kentucky Fried Chicken in the Mission District raised a banner selling oven roasted chicken with tortillas and salsa. But finally, the Colonel chickened out. The boy affair was only on a trial basis. Colonel Sanders may have been making a lot of wine in downtown Beijing, but in the Mission District, he has he was losing dinero to tacos. The growing popularity of fast food, uh, fast Mexican food in barrios such as the Mission District, will be a significant turning point in the national taco war. Our burritos and tacos are not only the real thing, but our first line of defense. The first food entrepr uh, the first food enterprise is crashing on the unabashed. Uh, no, the fast food enterprise is crashing in on the unabashed sale of anglicized and commercialized Mexican food to low-income Latinos. And the message is clear. Hey, we can't make it as good as you can, but we can sure sell it faster and cheaper than you. Some hard shell Chicanos and Mexicanos wouldn't be caught dead in one of these Taco Bells. For others, though, an empty stomach and pocketbook do not distinguish the real thing. Six, a mixed textile marriage. According to Cecilia, my wife, we have a mixed marriage. She's from California, I'm from Texas. Though we have no regrets, this truly proves that love is beyond blind. When Cecilia and I first met, we thought we had a lot in common. As young professional Chicanos in Washington, D.C., we both supported the United Farm Workers Grape and Lettuce Boycotts, the Coors Boycott, the Gallo Wine Boycott, the Farrah Pants Boycott, and the Frito Bandido Boycott. We still boycott some of these items for many, however, uh, for many reasons, health, habit, nostalgia, or plain extraordinary guilt, if we indulge in any of these. As first-generation Mexican-Americans, we both spoke... Espanol graduated from Catholic schools and had similar politics. But as we were soon to discover, the vast desert that separates Texas and California also differentiates the culture and style of Chicanos. Because we met far from Texas and California, we had no idea at first at the severity of our differences. We both like enchiladas, the same enchiladas that I thought until the first time Cecilia prepared them. They look like enchiladas, they smell like enchiladas, and then I bit into one. These are good, corazón, I said, but these are entomatadas. They have more tomato than chile. My mamá used to make them all the time. She threw me a piquant stare as I chewed away. Mm, they're great, I just thrust through a mouthful. Californians like her parents who immigrated from the coastal state of Jalisco, Mexico, use more tomatoes than Texans like my parents, 
who came from the central states of Durango and Zacatecas and used more chiles. Cecilia grew up with white menudo tripe soup. White menudo? How could anyone eat colorless menudo and not put hominy in it? Ours was red hot and loaded with hominy. In Texas, we ate our menudo with bread. In California, it was tortillas. Texas flour tortillas are thick and tasty. California flour tortillas are so thin you can see through them. She didn't particularly like my Tony Lama boots or my country western and Tex-Mex musical taste. I wasn't that crazy about Beach Boy music or her progressive California style country western. In California, the beach was relatively close for Cecilia. On her first date, she asked how often I went to the beach from El Paso. Apparently, geography has never been a hot subject in California schools. That's understandable considering the sad taste or sad state of education, especially geography in this country. But in Texas, at one time the biggest state in the union, sizes and distances are most important. In answer to Cecilia's question, I explained that to get the closest uh, beach from El Paso, I had to create new Mex Mexico, Arizona, and California to reach San Diego. Oh, I had to cross New Mexico. In answer to Cecilia's question, I explained that to get to the closest beach from El Paso, I had to cross New Mexico, Arizona, and California to reach San Diego. That's 791 freeway miles. The closest Texas beach is 841 freeway miles to the Gulf of Mexico. Back when we were courting, California Chicanos at Tejanos as a little too Mexicano, still wet behind the ears, not assimilated enough in speaking with either thick Spanish accents or taxes accents. Generally speaking, Tejanos saw their Califas counterparts as too weird, knowing too little, if any, Spanish and with speech that was too anglicized. After our marriage, we settled in neutral Alexandria, Virginia, right across the uh, Potomac from the nation's capital. We lived there a couple of years, and when our firstborn came, we decided to settle closer to home. But which home? Califas or Texas? In El Paso, we wouldn't be close to the beach, but I thought there was an ocean of opportunity in that desert town. There was some Texas pride and machismo, to be sure. It was a tug of war that escalated to the point of seeking advice, and eventually I had to be realistic and agree that California had better opportunities. In EPT, the opportunities in my field were non-existent. The rest is a relative bliss. Married since 1972. I'm totally spoiled and laid back in Northern Califas, but I still miss many of those things we took for granted in Texas or Washington, D.C. The seasonal changes, the snow, the heat, heating systems, autumn color, and monsoon rains. The smell of the desert after a rain, the silence and serenity of the desert, the magnifying sounds of a fly or a cricket, distant horizons uncluttered by trees, and the ability to find the four directions without any problem. I do miss the desert and even more the food. El Paso is the Mexican food capital of this country. Today, I like artichokes and appreciate a wide variety of vegetables and fruit. I even like white colorless menudo and hardly ever drink beer. I drink wine, but it has to be a dry Chardonnay or Fume Blanc, although a Pinot Noir or a Cabaret Sauvignon goes great with meals. Although I still yearn for an ice cold Perla or Lone Star beer from Texas once in a while, Khalifa's is my home now, mixed marriage and all.